On Saturday the 1st of October, just last year, a 25-year-old man from Mississippi named Rashim Carter would suddenly call his mother in a panic, claiming that he was being followed by a group of men in trucks who were shouting racial slurs in his direction. Fearing for her child's life, she immediately advised him to head over to the nearest police station to report the incident and to ask for a lift home. However, in response to his desperate pleas, the Taylorsville Police Department claimed that they were not a taxi service and that because his home was out of their jurisdiction, there was nothing they could do. So, with no other options, Rasheem then called a family friend to pick him up from a gas station in Taylorsville, to which she thankfully agreed. However, after arriving on the scene, Rasheem was mysteriously nowhere to be found, eventually leading his mother to file a missing persons report. But unfortunately, there would be no real updates to the case until a month later, when the skeletal remains of Rashim Carter were found, with his head separated from his body. Despite the incredibly controversial details, however, to this day, the case remains an open investigation, with the police strongly believing that nobody else was involved and that his death was nothing more than an accident. So, was this just another tragic story of mental illness? Or was Rashim Carter the victim of a modern-day lynching in Mississippi? Rashim Rael Carter was born on the 28th of October in 1996 in Fayette, Mississippi, to his devoted parents, Tiffany Carter and Robert Fry. Little was known about his younger years, but he would eventually go on to attend Jefferson County High School, where he was a keen sportsman representing his school in both American football and baseball. He would later go on to graduate in 2015, with plans to continue his studies at the nearby Heinz Community College, where he would hone his skills as a tradesman. And then, just a year later, he would graduate once again with a degree in welding and cutting technology where he would eventually land a job in his chosen field as a welder, working for a privately owned company. But this wasn't the only good news for Rashim, as during his studies, he would be blessed with a beautiful daughter named Kali, who immediately became the light of his life. Family and friends described Rashim as outgoing, charitable and even entrepreneurial, as in 2019 he would open up a popular seafood restaurant in the city of Fayette, aptly named Kali's Express after his very own daughter. However, despite the initial success of his business, Rashim wasn't able to withstand the economic collapse of the coronavirus pandemic, so with the public in quarantine, the restaurant had to be temporarily shut down. But refusing to give up on his dream, Rashim managed to find work as a welder once again, accepting a short-term contract to work out in the neighbouring town of Taylorsville where he planned on saving as much money as possible in order to reopen the doors of his restaurant to save the struggling business. By all accounts, although Rashim Carter was still a very young man, he had a good head on his shoulders. So in late September of 2022, he decided to travel more than two hours east of Fayette to Taylorsville to work this welding job. During this time, he chose to stay at a Super 8 motel in the city of Laurel, which was about a half an hour drive southeast from Taylorsville. But despite his work ethic and likeable personality, Rashim would soon run into some problems with his co-workers. But soon after this strange event, Rashim would then go on to tell his family that he was not getting on with the owner of the company, and rather harrowingly, in a text message sent to his mother Tiffany Carter, he stated, If anything happens to me, he's responsible for it. Well, it wasn't long before Rashim would message his mother once again, but little did she know, this would be the last time she would ever get to speak to her son, as just the next day, he would suddenly disappear without a trace. On Saturday the 1st of October, the 25-year-old man was getting ready to start his shift with a company known as Clements Mechanicals and was looking for a ride to work. Although Rashim did have a driver's license due to his financial situation at the time, he couldn't afford to fix his car which had broken down shortly before he started his new position. So, this meant that he had been forced to rely on lifts from a co-worker who also happened to be staying with him at the Super 8 motel. But after getting into a heated argument during the journey to Taylorsville, Rashim decided to get out of the vehicle and make his own way meaning the young man was forced to walk for around 20 miles. 
Eventually, he arrived in southeastern Smith County, where he decided to try and call another co-worker to see if they would be willing to give him a lift into town. Luckily, somebody agreed to help, and Rasheem was dropped off at the Family Dollar Store in Taylorsville, where he would attempt to call his family for further support. However, after speaking to his mother, he soon learned that she was unable to pick him up, and asked if there was any other way he could find his way back to the motel. So with Rasheem not wanting to be a burden, he assured her that he could find an alternative option, and then soon began his search. But as he was leaving the dollar store, Rasheem would overhear the store clerk having a conversation with somebody on the phone, convinced that they were talking about him. So, you can imagine his panic when the clerk suddenly muttered the words, he's in here. In response, Rasheem then rushed out of the store, paranoid that someone was looking for him. But the situation only grew in severity when the faint sound of male voices began approaching him. And as they got closer, he started to make out what these voices were saying. According to Rashim, he then turned around and noticed three separate trucks all driving in his direction, with white men inside screaming racial insults towards him as they grew closer and closer. Well, understandably fearing for his life, Rashim then contacted his mother once again, this time asking her what he should do about the situation, to which she immediately begged him to go to the police to report the incident. So, as advised, Rashim then made his way over to the local police station in Taylorsville, where he reported his experience and asked the police for a ride home. But surprisingly, rather than taking his pleas seriously, the officers instead refused his request, later being quoted as saying, they were not a taxi service, and that his home was outside their jurisdiction, so there was nothing they could do. He also asked if he could perhaps borrow a cell phone charger as he was down to 1% battery, but once again, the police refused to assist, claiming that they did not possess the correct charger for his phone. So with Rashim pretty much out of options, he then decided to head over to a local gas station where he would purchase a charger, before scouring his phone for contacts to try and get a lift home from somebody else. But this time, he was thankfully able to get through to a family friend named Aisha Green, who agreed to drive out all the way to Taylorsville, given the dangerous circumstances he had experienced that day. But despite being given the clear instructions to wait at the gas station to be picked up, for some strange reason, Rashim decided to wander outside. He was then seen on CCTV footage leaving the station looking scared and confused, and was eventually spotted by a police officer who took him back to the station. According to the authorities, they offered to let him stay at the police station while he waited for his ride, but rather contentiously, Rashim apparently declined the offer, suggesting he was okay and was planning on meeting his family friend elsewhere. So eventually, he decided to leave the safe zone of the police station, instead opting to wait somewhere else despite his fears of being hunted down. But assuming this is in fact what happened, this decision would later turn out to be a huge mistake as the young man would never be seen alive again. On Sunday the 2nd of October, Rashim's mother Tiffany Carter made the 100 mile drive out to Taylorsville from her home in Fayette, as she had been informed by the family friend Aisha that the troubled young man had failed to meet her at the gas station. According to Aisha, she attempted to get in touch with Rashim but was unable to make contact eventually leading her to call Tiffany to inform her of Rashim's strange behaviour. So, once Tiffany arrived, the two women scoured the area together, attempting to find any evidence of Rashim, speaking to potential witnesses as they tried to create a timeline of events and asking the Taylorsville PD for their assistance. But unfortunately, despite a few interesting details, such as Rashim apparently offering random strangers in a junior food mart $100 to drive him home, the pair were unable to uncover any useful information that would allude to his whereabouts. So, with nowhere else to look in Taylorsville, they drove back to Laurel, where Rashim was supposed to be staying at the Super 8 Motel, and once again performed an unsuccessful search, eventually leading to the missing person report being filed with the Laurel Police Department. At this point, Tiffany Carter was really starting to worry about her missing son especially due to the fact that before he went missing, he had been fearing for his life, so it was difficult for the concerned mother to remain optimistic. But despite the odds being against her, Tiffany continued fighting alongside her good friend Aisha, 
and together they were persistently calling the police departments for any updates, praying that one day they would finally get the good news they were waiting for. And then, exactly one month after Rashim had officially been reported missing, there would be a massive break in the case. But unfortunately, any trace of hope was immediately extinguished in one harrowing moment, as the Taylorsville PD would discover something truly horrifying. On Wednesday the 2nd of November, Tiffany Carter would receive a call from the police with the devastating news that they had found the remains of her son, just five days after what would have been his 26th birthday. Well, as you can imagine, Tiffany along with the rest of the family were utterly broken by this update, as despite knowing that it could be a possibility, this didn't make the reality any easier to handle. According to the officials, Rashim's remains were discovered at the Deer Park off of Highway 37, roughly a mile south of Taylorsville. They were initially led to the area after an image was captured on a hunter's camera in the woods, and after Tiffany claimed the person in the picture looked similar to her son, a search was conducted in the surrounding area. Once the body was located, it was then transferred to the Mississippi State Crime Lab, where it took examiners a few weeks to determine if it was in fact Rashim's body. However, I think it would be safe to say that they were already pretty certain beforehand, as his wallet and ID as well as his jeans and other personal items were located with the body. But despite the incredibly bizarre timeline of events leading up to Rashim's disappearance and eventual death, the sheriff indicated that no foul play was suspected almost instantaneously, leading the entire Carter family bewildered to say the least. Somehow, before even looking into any potential suspects, the police seemed to have already made up their mind. Between the time he went missing and his remains being found, efforts were made by the Taylorsville Police Department and Carter's family, including a search party to locate him. The search included reviewing security footage at the local family dollar where they knew he had been seen, but there just didn't ever seem to be any leads to come from all of these discoveries leading the speculation that the police department may have potentially been fumbling the case on purpose to cover up the truth. To add fuel to the fire, it was also revealed that the remains of Rashim that were discovered were only partial, with his skull and spinal cord being found in separate locations. As far as the family were concerned, this piece of evidence heavily alluded to foul play, given that there was no reasonable explanation for how his head had so quickly separated from the rest of his body. However, the police seemed to stick to their guns, claiming that after interviewing all of the key suspects who worked with Rashim at the welding company, that they had all been successfully ruled out with confirmed alibis. A Smith County Sheriff named Joel Houston later came out to say that his department interviewed everybody involved, including four to five people that he had specifically mentioned to his mother as possible threats. Sheriff Houston said police ruled them out after determining through phone records and GPS coordinates that their devices were nearly 100 miles away from Taylorsville at another job site when Rashim was last seen alive. The sheriff also added that Rashim's colleagues and supervisor mentioned in their interviews that he had not been himself for about a week before he went missing. They claimed that his whole demeanour had changed, they weren't sure what was going on. They just said he kept to himself more, he usually joked around and in the last week or so they weren't able to do that. Also, although it was true that Rashim had undergone a couple of verbal altercations with at least one co-worker, the sheriff did not say what the disagreement was about, or whether the altercation prompted Rashim's behaviour change, so this left the door open to a potential motive. But once again, there was still not enough evidence available to convince the authorities that any foul play had occurred in this case. And so one year on from this devastating tragedy, we are still no closer to finding out what really happened to Rashim Carter that day. Now unfortunately, this is all we know about the case for now, but Rashim's mother Tiffany, alongside her friends and family, are refusing to give up the fight with the intention of catching a responsible culprit and bringing them to justice. Of course, it is still possible that Rashim's death may have simply been a tragic accident caused by poor decision making or mental health issues, but until we have a definitive explanation, we have to keep this case alive, so Rashim's grieving family can finally get the closure they deserve. So with that, let's get into some of the potential theories. 
Now, before I get into some of the more controversial theories that surround this case, as always, I would prefer to start by giving the police the benefit of the doubt before I start hypothesizing any possible cover-ups. So, could Rashim's death have actually been a self-inflicted accident? Well, the obvious angle to take here would of course be a potential psychotic break that Rashim had suddenly suffered that day. After all, according to his colleagues, he had apparently been acting strange all week in the days leading up to his disappearance. So if these comments are true, this would allude to Rashim possibly suffering from some sort of mental health issue. Also, the claims made by Rashim himself about the three trucks chasing him with white men shouting racial slurs was an incident that could not be corroborated by a single member of the public. So the fact that nobody has come forward to this day would imply that this entire scenario was just made up by Rashim himself. In addition, the coroner's report did not reveal any evidence of foul play, which would once again allude to the fact that Rashim could not have been a victim of anybody except for the elements or himself. But saying this, the autopsy also couldn't rule out the possibility of foul play either, and according to the report, there were no real signs of gnaw marks on where an animal would have had to have bitten through to separate the skull from the body. Which raises the question, if an animal didn't decapitate his body, then who did? Ultimately, the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation reportedly said that due to the condition of the remains, the medical examiner could not reasonably determine a cause of death, so this leaves the investigation open, in my opinion, to other possible theories. I of course do not deny the fact that Rashim's body was likely dismembered and scavenged by the wildlife in the time he was deceased. However, the big question for me is how he ended up losing his life in the first place. And with zero evidence to prove he died by his own accord, I believe we have to keep looking at other potential explanations for this tragedy. So, with this in mind, could Rashim Carter have been the victim of a police cover-up? Well, one thing that is for certain in this case is that the police have been consistently adamant that there was likely no foul play involved, even making the bold assumption after first discovering the body. Now, I will just say that the Taylorsville police have since explained that their reason for initially claiming no foul play was purely because they didn't want the public to be worried. But I personally don't buy this and have two points to combat this excuse. Firstly, if they could not confirm that foul play was involved at the time, telling the public that it was essentially safe to walk the streets when for all they knew there could have been a racist serial killer on the loose, would seem to be extremely unprofessional at the least, and potentially life-threatening at the worst. Secondly, given that the police were well aware of Rashim's harrowing story of being followed by racist men in trucks with the young man claiming his life was in danger, Surely the first assumption as an officer would be to assume that he was likely a victim of one of these potential suspects. Keep in mind, they hadn't actually talked to any suspects yet at the time of making such a bold claim that no foul play was involved. So once again, there could have very well been a murderous psychopath out on the streets of Taylorsville. Plus, based on Rashim's story, it would have been sensible in my opinion to warn the public of a potential predator, rather than sugarcoating the very controversial situation. But either way, let's say the police did have good intentions, and simply wanted to avoid a mass panic throughout the town. This certainly wasn't the only questionable decision of the Taylorsville Police Department, as they would also go on to mock the efforts of Rashim's family in their search for answers. During one of the protests that were held in response to Rashim's case, a protester marked the street in chalk with a message that read, Rashim's life mattered, only to have the chief of Taylorsville police remove the message and post an image of his actions with the caption, just a little cleanup. Now I know I'm not alone in thinking this decision was far from respectful, and it certainly paints a rather disgusting picture of the police force that were in charge of Rashim's case. So based on this event, along with some of the other questionable decisions made by the Taylorsville PD, you can certainly see why so many people are outraged by their behaviour. To me, it seems like they have this narrative of a self-inflicted death that they have been leaning towards since the very start of the case, despite the mass amounts of evidence that prove otherwise. So from my perspective, there is undoubtedly a strong case here to question if the police could potentially be trying to cover something up. But even if this was true, what would be their motive? 
Well, firstly, Taylorsville is an extremely tight community, with only a little over 1,000 people living in the town as of last year. Also, with small towns, word tends to get around fast, so if a resident of Taylorsville was involved with the death of Rashim, it wouldn't be impossible to keep everybody's mouth shut, and there would likely be an urge from the police to protect their own. I think another point to mention is that Mississippi has a rich history associated with lynchings and racism, so if a hate crime had occurred in their small town, they would surely not want a story like this to come out. Let's be honest, the public view of Taylorsville would be surely tarnished forever if they became known as the town of modern day lynchings, so it wouldn't surprise me if the police opted to keep the truth a secret for what they viewed as the greater good. One final mention here would also have to be that given Rashim's argument with his co-worker, which was backed by multiple sources, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to assume that this co-worker could have reacted in revenge. I know the police came out to say that they had managed to get proven alibis from all of the colleagues at work, but if this case was a cover-up, then the police could have very easily fabricated these alibis to remove suspicion. Perhaps one of the workers was related to a police officer. But either way, just as we cannot prove that Rashim died from a tragic accident, we also can't prove that there was a cover-up here. So until there is more evidence to back this theory, it would probably be useful to look at other similar cases to see if there are any potential links that may allude to a wider conspiracy. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, then you know I have covered many controversial cases of missing people that were either never found or found deceased under extremely suspicious circumstances. But there are two cases in particular which I would like to mention in this video as I feel they both offer very similar variables to Rashim's story, and therefore may provide some useful context here. So the first case I'd like to bring up is the mysterious disappearance of Daniel Robinson, who was a black 24-year-old who had recently started working for a company far away from home out in Arizona, who strangely went missing one day, never to return. Now just like Rashim, Daniel also had a strange encounter with one of his co-workers just before he went missing, with this particular colleague also claiming that Daniel had been acting very strange in the build-up to his disappearance. Many have speculated that Daniel may have uncovered a dark secret about the company he was working for, as he had recently taken a job with a company out in Arizona named Weber Water Resources, and if you know anything about Arizona, you will be well aware that it is a very dry state with a large water scarcity problem. So many have hypothesized that Daniel uncovered a secret about the way this company were interacting with the water sources and was killed to shut him up, with his car wreck later being staged to pretend that he took his own life by accident. So. Could Rashim have also been killed for learning a dark secret about Clement's mechanicals out in Taylorsville? Another point to mention is that in both cases, the local police handled their jobs terribly, with Daniel's father and Rashim's mother having to fight tooth and nail to get any kind of investigation going. I suppose you could argue that the simple link here could just be that both cases were handled very poorly by the police in charge, but either way, Daniel Robinson isn't the only strange case that, in my opinion, has several relevant parallels to the case of Rashim Carter. As you probably already guessed from the thumbnail of this video, the other case I would also like to discuss is the mysterious death of Ryan Singleton. Now, just like Daniel and Rashim, he was a black man in his mid-twenties who was in an unfamiliar area far away from home. He had been travelling to LA in his rented vehicle from Las Vegas, when his car suddenly ran out of gas and he was forced to hitch a ride to the nearest town to make a phone call. Once there, he organised a ride home with one of his friends and agreed to meet them at the gas station. But just like in the case of Rashim Carter, when the friend arrived, Ryan was nowhere to be found. Also, again just like Rashim, Ryan's body would later be discovered around a month after his disappearance and he was also found deceased under extremely suspicious circumstances. However, one key difference was that Ryan's organs were missing from his body, with the rest of him appearing to be somewhat intact, almost as if he had been cut open and foraged for parts. Now, as nefarious as this sounds, the police in Ryan's story also concocted a narrative that he somehow experienced a random episode of psychosis, and wandered off into the desert only to die of something like dehydration. 
From there, the local wildlife would apparently then go on to steal his organs, suspiciously leaving certain body parts behind that they usually wouldn't. So it would seem, despite not having any hard evidence of self-infliction, in both Rashim Carter's case and Ryan Singleton's case, the police were incredibly quick to wrap up the story as swiftly as possible, providing a completely circumstantial explanation as the conclusion. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that despite there being just as much evidence to prove murder as there was for accidental death, the police in both stories decided to choose the latter, which to me implies somewhat of a cover-up as they were so desperate to close the case without any conclusive evidence available. Let's be honest, I think we can all agree that in Rashim's case, as well as in Daniel and Ryan's cases, if the family did not chase the police for answers, then the investigations would have very likely been wrapped up years ago under the guise of self-infliction. So that's why I feel these videos are so important to make, as if we stop talking about these unsolved cases, then the world just moves on, leaving the families without any answers or closure. Anyway, with that, I think I'll leave this video here, but if you have any theories of your own which you think may explain what happened to Rashim Carter, please leave your ideas in the comments down below and I will do my best to get back to you. But until then, thank you so much for watching and make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also, if you would like to hear more about the other cases I featured in this video, feel free to check out the playlist on screen now.